Dear students, in this session, we are going to discuss about the strain improvement techniques used for improving the productivity and other characteristics of industrially important microorganisms. We know if we have to use a microorganism as an industrially important production strain, ideally it should have the following properties. The nutritional characteristics of the organism should allow it to grow in a cheap medium. It should have a high productivity and it should not produce different types of byproducts. The product should be easily recovered from the culture growth during the downstream processing. The organism should be safe. It should not be pathogenic and it should not produce any toxic agents. The organism should show rapid growth. The optimum temperature of the organism should be ideally above 40 degrees Celsius so that we can reduce the cooling cost if you are using that organism in large scale fermentation processes. The microorganism should not react with the equipment. The organism, the productivity and other characteristics should be stable and at the same time it should be amenable to genetic manipulation so that we can improve its productivity and other characteristics. The organism should also be resistant to phage attack. So to obtain such an ideal industrial microorganism, we have to perform isolation and screening techniques by which we will try to obtain an ideal industrial microorganism. But generally, such an ideal industrial microbe does not exist. We have to improve the characteristics of the isolate so as to meet, so as to make the organism highly productive and highly suitable for our fermentation process. In any industrial microbial fermentation, economic benefit is the major motivation. To make the fermentation economically favorable, there are several concerns. We can have a cheap medium formulator which will allow the microorganisms to grow and produce the product in maximum rate. We can have the fermentation use minimum amount of energy. So the minimum amount of energy for running the fermentation will decrease the production cost. The downstream processing should be as easy as possible to make the recovery of the product in an easier fashion. Among these various factors which we can modify to make our fermentation economically favorable, the most important one is the industrial microorganism. If we can have an industrially important organism or the industrial strain which is capable of growing at a faster rate, which can produce the industrial product at a faster rate, at a high production potential, then it will improve the economic benefit of the industrial fermentation. So, the improvement of industrial microorganisms in terms of their productivity as well as in their other characteristics the economic benefit is a major motivation. To make a microorganism an industrial strain, we have to increase its product yield. Generally, the isolates that we have obtained during the screening and isolation procedures, they are the natural isolates. They will produce the commercially important product only in very low concentrations. To improve their productivity, we can increase the product yield either by optimizing the culture medium or by optimizing their growth conditions. Since the potential productivity of this organism generally is controlled by its gen genetic material, genome, we cannot improve much of its productivity only by optimizing these cultural conditions. To increase its productivity further, we need to modify its genome. So 
The strain improvement technique involves the continual genetic modification of the natural isolate and after the genetic modification we will follow further cultural condition modifications, modifications of the cultural media etc to improve their productivity further and further. Through strain improvement techniques we try to improve the productivity of the industrial microbe. The strain improvement is done either to increase the productivity of the organism in terms of its biomass or primary metabolite or the secondary metabolite. The strain improvement technique is generally done by means of genetic modification of the organism. So we can do genetic modification to improve the industrial usefulness of an organism to improve its industrial productivity. The genetic modification may be achieved by selecting the natural variants, by selecting induced mutants or by selecting recombinants. Among these three approaches, the first approach that is the selection of natural variants is not that much reliable due to the fact that there is only a very small probability of a genetic change occurring naturally and further the chance of these rare genetic changes to have an impact upon the productivity of the organism is very very small. So we cannot rely on natural variants for improvement in productivity due to this very small probability of a genetic change occurring naturally. So to improve the strain productivity we can have the second and third approaches the selection of induced mutants and the selection of recombinants. These approaches are usually done. So in the case of selection of induced mutants we can select the induced mutants for improved levels of primary metabolites. For this technique, we can either isolate analog resistant mutants or we can isolate revertants or to have improved yields of secondary metabolites. We can select the induced mutants either by isolating analog resistant mutants or by the isolation of revertant mutants or we can isolate the oxotrophic mutants. The selection of recombinants is done to improve the productivity either by performing the parasexual cycle or by protoplast fusion techniques or by recombinant DNA techniques. The recombinant DNA techniques are generally done for the production of heterologous proteins or for the increased production of native products. And we can use these techniques, the selection of induced mutants or the selection of recombinants for improving the properties of the industrially important organism in which the properties other than the yield of the product will be improved, will be modified. Selecting induced mutants. So, to improve the productivity of an industrially important microorganism, we can induce mutation in the culture of the industrial microorganism. And after inducing the mutation, we will select certain mutants based upon their productivity. So, we can select induced mutants for improved levels of primary metabolites or for improved levels of secondary metabolite. Selection of induced mutants synthesizing improved levels of primary metabolites. We know in any organism the metabolic 
pathways are regulated by different mechanisms among which the feedback inhibition by the product on the key enzymes of the pathway is the most important one. So, to obtain an industrially important strain that have improved levels of primary metabolite productivity, we can select the mutants which are modified such that there is no feedback inhibition by the product. This can be obtained, this can be achieved by several mechanisms. In the first approach, the product may be lost from the cell due to abnormality in cell membrane permeability. So here, the cell membrane permeability is altered such that the product which is formed due to the metabolic pathway will get released from the cell as and when it is being synthesized. As a result, the cell will continue on synthesizing the product and as a result, our industrial strain will have high productivity of that particular product. In the second approach, the organism does not produce end product which control the key enzyme of the pathway. This approach could be used only if our product is the not is not the end product. So, if there is a pathway in which a substrate A is converted to the product D through the intermediary products B and C and in our fermentation the product of our choice of our interest is C then we can select the organism as our industrial strain if it does not produce the final end product D. If the organism cannot produce the final end product D which is the key controller of the pathway then there is no feedback inhibition since this product D is not being synthesized the enzyme function the enzyme pathway will continue and it will result in the accumulation of the product C and C is our industrial product. So this approach is useful in the case of pathways in which our product is not the end product which have the regulatory effect upon the key enzymes of the pathway. And in the third approach the organism does not recognize the presence of end product which control the key enzymes of the pathway. So here if there is a pathway starting from the substrate A and the end product D there are two intermediaries the product B and C. So the third approach is useful if our industrial product is the final end product D. So here the organism should produce the final end product since it is our industrial product but in order to make the organism to synthesize this final end product in higher concentrations we will try to modify the organism so that it will not recognize the presence of this particular end product so that this end product will not exert a feedback inhibition and its production will be carried out by the enzyme pathway continually and this can be achieved either by the isolation of analog resistant mutants or by the isolation of revertants. So what is the isolation of analog resistant mutants? Analog is a compound which is very similar in structure to another compound. So generally analogs of amino acids, vitamins, nucleotides etc. are growth inhibitory or highly toxic since they impair with the normal metabolism by mimicking their natural molecule and altering the control mechanisms. Analog resistant mutants are mutants which does not identify or recognize the product or its structural analog as a feedback inhibitor and as a result the organism will continue to produce the product in high levels without any feedback inhibition.
the isolation of analog resistant mutants may be done by the gradient plate technique. So we will use a structural analog to the product of our interest. The gradient plate technique allows a gradual proportional increase of drug concentration in the agar medium. The resistant mutants are isolated by exposing the culture after a mutation treatment to the analog, the structural analog in a growth medium. The organism after the mutation treatment when it is exposed to the toxic analogs, the colonies which will develop will be the ones which are resistant to the analog. They are resistant mutants. In a gradient plate technique, molten agar medium containing the analog will be poured into a slightly slanted petri dish. The petri dish will be kept in a slanted position and it will be allowed to solidify. After the solidification of this agar, a layer of medium which does not contain the analog will be added over the first layer and it will be allowed to set with the plate level. In such a plate, the analog from the upper layer will diffuse into the lower layer giving a concentration gradient across the plate. When the culture after the mutation treatment is spread over the surface of this plate upon incubation the resistant mutants can be detected as isolated colonies in a region of high concentration of the analog while in the region having low concentration of the analog will show a confluent growth. So for our purpose we will isolate the isolated colonies from the high concentration analog zone and these are the analog resistant mutants which will have improved productivity due to their inability to recognize the presence of the analog as well as our product, the end product as a feedback inhibitor. These resistant organisms are resistant to the presence of analog as well as the presence of the final end product. So in these organisms, the final end product cannot exert the feedback inhibition and as a result, such analog resistant mutants will produce the product in higher concentrations. For isolation of revertants, the revertants are obtained once an oxotrophic mutant is having a second set of mutation. An oxotrophic mutant is one which have lost the potential of producing a particular metabolite. For growing an oxotrophic mutant, we have to produce, provide all the necessary nutrients. So, such a oxotrophic organism may revert. It may have a second mutation by which it will revert to the phenotype of the mutant parent. So, now it is capable of producing that particular metabolite which it was not capable of producing due to its oxotrophic conversion. The oxotroph was not able to produce a particular metabolite but upon the reversion mutation, now it is capable of producing that particular metabolite. But sometimes during this reversion mutation, the enzyme of the revertant may lose its ability to be controlled through feedback inhibition of the product. During this reversion mutation, the enzyme activity is regained, but the enzyme might have lost its ability to be regulated. So, such an revertant, such a mutant, have lost the regulatory properties of a particular enzyme and as a result, since it have lost the feedback inhibition capacity, such revertants will continue on producing high levels 
of the product. So these are the two approaches by which we can isolate an organism which does not recognize the present presence of the end product which control the key enzymes of the pathway. The isolation of analog resistant mutants and the isolation of revertins. Now let us look into how to improve the yields of secondary metabolite by isolating induced mutants. The isolation of induced mutants producing improved levels of secondary metabolite. Approaches for the improvement of secondary metabolite producers are the isolation of analog resistant mutants, isolation of revertent mutants or the isolation of exotrophic mutants. Coming to the first one, the isolation of analog resistant mutants. Mutants may be isolated which are resistant to the presence of which can grow in the presence of analogs of primary metabolic precursors of the secondary metabolite or the mutants which are resistant to the feedback effects of the secondary metabolite or the mutants which are resistant to the toxic effects of the secondary metabolite or which are resistant to the toxic effect of a compound due to the production of the secondary metabolite. In the second approach, in the isolation of revertent mutants, a mutant may revert to the phenotype of its parent, but the genotype of the revertent may not necessarily be the same as the original parent. Some revertent mutants, some revertent oxotrophs, similar as in the case of the primary metabolite producers, might have gained improved levels of secondary metabolite productivity. So we can isolate revertent mutants which are oxotrophic for primary metabolites which may influence the production of a secondary metabolite or we can isolate revertent mutants which have lost their ability to produce the secondary metabolite. For the isolation of oxotrophic mutant, if there is an oxotrophic mutant which have lost the ability to produce a particular metabolite, we can grow the such an oxotrophic mutant by supplementing that particular growth molecule, that particular nutrient. In some cases, the supplementation of this particular nutrient which the oxotrophic mutant is not capable of producing, the supplementation of that particular nutrient may enhance the secondary metabolite productivity. We can also use recombination systems for genetically modifying and improving the industrially important microorganisms. The different approaches are the use of parasexual cycle, protoplast fusion techniques and recombinant DNA technique. So what is a parasexual cycle? Many industrially important fungi do not possess a sexual stage during their reproduction. So it is very difficult to achieve recombination in these organisms. However, these organisms possess a parasexual cycle through which a nuclear fusion and gene segregation takes place in these organisms. In order for the parasexual recombination to take place, the nuclear fusion first must, must occur between unlike nuclei in the vegetative hyphae of the organism and after the nuclear fusion, there will be establishment of a heterocarion and after this, the mitotic crossing over and haploidization will occur resulting in the formation of either a diploid recombinant or a haploid recombinant. Such recombinants may have improved productivity. The second approach is the protoplast fusion technique. Protoplasts are cells devoid of the cell wall and they may be prepared by subjecting the cells to the action of wall degrading enzymes. The protoplast may regenerate their cell walls 
and then they can grow as normal cells. So we can easily fuse together to protoplast. The cells will fuse together followed by a nuclear fusion. Such protoplast fusion may occur between cells of strains which would otherwise do not fuse. And such a protoplast fusion, it can regenerate its cell wall and grow as a normal cell. We can use the fusion of fungal protoplast to obtain heterocarions between the strains which may have improved productivity. The third approach is the recombinant DNA technique. This is the method, the technique by which transfer of DNA between different species of organisms can be achieved. Thus, genetic material from one species may be incorporated into another species where it will be expressed and the product will be produced. For this procedure, a vector DNA molecule which may be either a plasmid or a phage which can enter the host cell and replicate within it is used. We have to use a method of splicing or cutting foreign genetic material and it should be inserted into the vector. After preparing the vector foreign DNA recombinant, after constructing this, per constructing this particular recombinant, it should be introduced into the host cell. And now the host cell will start synthesizing the foreign gene product. So we need to assay the organism for the particular productivity and such a recombinant organism will produce the product in higher levels. We can use the recombinant DNA technique for the production of heterologous proteins or for the production of increased levels of natural or native microbial products. The production of heterologous protein examples human growth hormone produced by a genetically modified Escherichia coli. That is the first commercially produced heterologous protein. This particular hormone, human growth hormone, is used to treat hypopituitary dwarfism and prior to its manufacture by this genetically modified E. coli fermentation, it was extracted from the brains of human cadavers. We can use the recombinant DNA technology for increasing the yield of native microbial products. So for this, we have to insert the chromosomal gene into a plasmid and the plasmid will be maintained in a high copy number in the host organism so that the organism will produce higher levels of the product. The industrially important microorganisms have to be improved in properties other than the yield of the product. The organism should be improved so that its stability is increased. It will gain resistance to infection by bacteriophages. We can decrease the foaming of the organism during fermentation. We can improve the strains so that they are resistant to components in the medium. The morphologically favorable strains can be obtained. We can improve the tolerance of the strains to lo low oxygen tension. The organisms should be modified such that the undesirable products are not produced by the organism. And we may modify the organism such that they will produce new fermentation products such as semi-synthetic penicillin, etc. We were discussing about the selection of natural variants, isolation of induced mutants and isolation of recombinants to improve the productivity of an industrially important microorganism. Thank you so much for listening.